Maserati is one of the most legendary automotive names. It evokes images of heroic racers competing head to head. Like so many automakers, its glamorous heritage wasn't enough to keep it from teetering on the brink. But Maserati was revived to produce a stunning array of exceptional road cars. Maserati celebrated its 90th anniversary in the summer of 2004. The company organized a grand tour from Milan to Rome of 90 specially decorated Maserati Spiders and Coupes. One car for each year of the company. Very few car companies have survived this long. It was something to celebrate. The festivities began in Milan's magnificent central square, the Plaza Duomo. The cars were parked around the square under the shadows of the Gothic Cathedral. The tour then headed to Modena, the epicenter of Italian sports car history and the current home of Maserati. They arrived at the Piazza Roma and parked in front of the Palazzo Ducali. While being in Motna was a great treat for the participants, it kept getting better. The company arranged a special VIP tour of the factory. It was a thrill for fans who came from as far away as America to see where the cars were built. Some were even more impressed with the historic cars that were also part of the festivities. Uh, the 90th anniversary was great, a uh, wonderful time. Um, we actually, as a club, several of us got there uh, several days early and it was great seeing the cars. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, historic Maseratis in my time, but this is uh, certainly the largest quantity and largest variety of uh, historic cars. Uh, the variety, the quality, the quantity, it was just mind-boggling. The tour continued on to Rome. As the cars paraded through the Eternal City and past the Colosseum, it was impossible not to think about history. While Maserati's 90-year span pales in comparison to the longevity of the Roman Empire, it's a remarkable story. The company was formed in 1914 when the automobile was still a relatively new contraption. It excited the imaginations of millions around the world. Road racing turned drivers into heroes and became a siren song to those who yearned to take the wheel. It was an exciting time. In Europe, cars were mostly for the wealthy but young and industrious enthusiasts found ways to transform their passion into a vocation. The Maserati brothers were inspired by these machines. In 1900, they'd proudly shown off their first four-wheeled vehicle. Its single-cylinder engine wasn't very powerful, but it was a start. World War I erupted and derailed their ventures. But Alfieri Maserati was running a spark plug factory and planning their next automotive move. After the war, the Maserati brothers revived their effort and began to modify the cars built by Azotto Fraschini. In their stock form, these cars attracted wealthy buyers who relished performance. This one belonged to film star Rudolf Valentino. They transformed the Italian luxury cars 
into road races for customers and to race themselves. Emilio Maserati and Ernesto were being celebrated for their racing victories and Alfieri was planning to build a car named Maserati. Another brother designed the company's distinct trademark, the Neptune Trident. Their first Maserati, the Type 26, was ready for its debut in April 1926. Its first outing was in the grueling Targa Florio road race in the hills of Sicily. The supercharged engine pushed it to victory. A glorious beginning for the Type 26 and its designer driver, Alfieri Maserati. Arch rival Tazio Nuvolari was the leading driver of the day. Fellow members of Enzo Ferrari's Alfa Romeo team felt overshadowed by him. This tension created an opening for Maserati. They lured Achille Bazzi away and he started to win for them. His new home seemed to unleash his talents. Wins at the Coppa Acerbo, the Monza Grand Prix and the Spanish Grand Prix and at other venues earned him the title Italian Champion. Other noted drivers like Giuseppe Campari, a member of the famous Aperitif family, and eventually even Nuvolari switched to Maserati. More wins resulted and the company's fame continued to grow. Alfieri also developed nimble, smaller displacement cars that were well suited for road races like the famed Mille Miglia. This tortuous race takes drivers through ancient villages and along twisty mountainous roads as they battle for a thousand miles. They won a first in the sports car class in 1931. 1932 brought more wins for Maserati. Campari took the checkered flag at the French Grand Prix. Another win for Maserati followed at the Rome Grand Prix, this time with Luigi Fagiolo at the wheel. While the company could celebrate, there was also tragedy. Alfieri Maserati unexpectedly died of kidney trouble. He was only 44. The arrival of a new breed of Grand Prix cars from Germany made winning difficult for Maserati. The Italians had great success in the 20s and into the mid 30s at automobile racing, be it uh, Grand Prix Formula type cars or closed wheel sports racers. By the uh, mid 30s though, uh, with the uh, government backed uh, racing programs uh, that the Germans had, uh, it was making it more difficult to, for companies like Alfa Romeo and Maserati to compete. The Mercedes and Alta Union teams were formidable. Their new aerodynamic cars made everything else old-fashioned. Maserati didn't have the money or the number of engineers to compete against this juggernaut. Like many racing uh, entities and, and families uh, of that era, um, they were always on a shoestring budget and uh, it was very difficult for them to always get their cars prepped in time, fully prepped, uh, etc. And they had to just do with, do with what they could uh, as best they could. And by 1938, um, it began to look very uh, much like a good opportunity to uh, sell Maserati. The company was in Hawk and the remaining brothers turned to an industrial tycoon from Modena. They were bought out, but were given a 10-year employment contract. It was never the same. There were still victories, 
especially the back-to-back -back wins at Indianapolis in 1939 and 40 by driver Wilbur Shaw. Shaw had beaten them in 1937, but switched to driving for Maserati. Maserati's win was the first time an Italian car maker had won the Indy 500. There was little time to celebrate. Once again, war engulfed Europe, and activities like auto racing disappeared. The fans became soldiers, and the Maserati brothers designed trucks for the military. After the war, Maserati began building road cars and also plunged back into racing. But the Maserati brothers left when their contract expired. And uh, the Maserati brothers went on to form their own uh, race car company called OSCA, O-S-C-A, and uh, continue to make race cars and uh, some limited street cars, uh, primarily based off of Fiat engines and uh, various chassis. Alfa Romeo and Maserati, without the brothers, began to compete once again. Germany was no longer a threat on the track. After World War II, um, the Germans pretty, were pretty much out of the picture in terms of competing uh, for quite a while. The Italians uh, jumped on board very quickly. Um, it was quite amazing how uh, the Italians, some, some Italians companies spent their time during the war preparing to go to race after the war, uh, where the Germans were still fighting the war. Maserati launched an all new car, the A6 GCS. It had a streamlined body with an offset engine. Albert Ascari drove the car to victory in its first outing at Modena, the company's new home. While Maserati was experiencing a revival, there was a new rival on the scene, Ferrari. In 1947, Ferrari and Maserati started an all-Italian battle on the world's leading race circuits. In 1953, their new driver, Juan Manuel Fangio, came in second in the world championship behind Ferrari. This helped to convince the company to develop a new racing car. The result, the 250F, started to win in 1954. This car gave Juan Manuel Fangio a victory in the Argentine Grand Prix and brought him the world's driver's title. Maserati's Grand Prix efforts peaked in 1957, when Fangio won the Formula One driver's world title for the fifth time. Fangio wasn't the only driver bringing Maserati glory. Sterling Moss and others helped the company win all sorts of competitions. But all this activity exacted a financial toll. Racing in Formula One was very expensive. Racing in the sports car series was very expensive. Maserati attempted to win both championships and almost pulled it off. Uh, the very last race of the season for the sports car closed wheel championship was in Caracas, uh, Venezuela. Within the first lap or two, two Maserati cars took each other out. Uh, there were other mishaps, uh, other accidents. So all five cars uh, that were entered failed to finish. Uh, Ferrari took the championship and uh, several of the cars were even left behind. This spelled the end of sponsored racing for Maserati. Even though they weren't running a factory team, Maserati did develop cars that private individuals and amateurs could use to compete. The most famous, the Type 60 and 61, are the birdcage Maseratis that first hit the track in 1958. They were called birdcage because the chassis were constructed out of some 200 slender tubes. The lightweight cars lit up the tracks. Birdcage was the hard car to have in 61, 62, um, and everybody clamored to try to have that ride. It had superb handling and a great power-to-weight ratio. 
the birdcage repeatedly beat the English sports cars and the Porsches. Sterling Moss took one to Rouen in France, where it won its first race in 1959, beating a pair of Lotus 15s. It became popular with sports car racers all over the world. Drivers like America's Carol Shelby also helped to keep the Maserati legend alive. But the real business of the company was building sporty road cars like the Mistrale, named after a strong wind. It emerged in 1963. The Mistrale is a, a great car. It's one of the earliest hatchback cars that I know about um, in a production car. And uh, it was one of the great Hot Wheels cars uh, of the 60s. All us kids, we all had it, uh, had one. Peter Ustinov had to have one of the real cars. The Mistrale was the last to use Maserati's venerable inline six. They kept making the engine bigger and adding horsepower. It came with either a manual or automatic transmission. It was a stylish GT car. For people who wanted more room, Maserati made a limited series of four-seaters called the Mexico, released in 1966. It would seat four people in relative comfort and transport them in style. A lot of elegance, uh, a lot of pizzazz, a lot of class. To me, it's the closest to an elegant Mercedes sedan or coupe of that same time period that Maserati made. Maserati also released a stunning coupe at the same time, the Ghibli. It was named after an Egyptian windstorm. It was a beautiful car, designed by Giorgetto Gijaro. It's been said that Henry Ford II was so impressed with the Ghiblis he bought that he wanted to buy the company. Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Sellers, and John Paul Belmondo also bought one. The Ghibli is one of the quintessential cars of that time period. But the company's owners were getting tired of being in the car business and sold out to Citroen in 1968. The acquisition of Maserati gave Citroen the opportunity to try something new. They developed a luxury coupe using a Maserati-built V6 engine. It was the fastest Citroen ever built. This was a French car with an Italian soul. Citroen's investment helped Maserati to introduce the Bora, its first mid-engine car, in 1971. In the early 70s, uh, under the helm of Citroen, Maserati moved into the realm of the uh, mid-engine car. And uh, back then, if you were going to call yourself an exotic car manufacturer, you had to be building a mid-engine car. But this success was not destined to last the pendulum was about to swing the other way. The late 60s were good times for uh, automobile manufacturers of exotic and high-end performance cars. However, by the early 70s, it was all over. Uh, OPEC came about, um, oil prices shot up, and uh, Maserati, along with virtually every other car manufacturer, was in a state of great turmoil. Citroen was also in trouble. It was sold to Renault, and the parent company walked away from Maserati. Eventually, with the help of the Italian government, Maserati was sold to Alejandro de Tommaso. When de Tommaso came along, he wanted to build something very different. 
he en enjoyed uh, cars that weren't as big and as grand. He, he liked some cars that were sporty and racy, but more diminutive. He himself was not a very uh, big man, not, not a very tall man. De Tomaso introduced the Bi-Turbo in 1981. This was a high-performance sedan. Maserati sold over 6,000 Bi-Turbos. De Tomaso really hit a home run with the Bi-Turbo in some ways. Uh, the Bi-Turbo was out, out of the gate an extreme success. But, uh, people clamored to buy the car. The car sold very well. One could call it uh, a poor man's uh, Maserati or an everyday man's uh, Maserati. It really went much more for uh, a mass appeal market. It was much more reasonably priced than traditional cars, um, and yet still had exotic performance. In 1991, De Tomaso took the company back into racing with the Barchetta. He set up a special single-make series of races that highlighted the Barchetta. Six races were held on Italian tracks in 1992 and 10 the following year, two of which took place outside Italy. Some of the cars were later equipped with headlights and other road gear so they could run on the streets. When both De Tommaso's health and businesses started to have problems, he began to look for a buyer for Maserati. Fiat stepped in and bought Maserati in 1993. It put 50% of the company into a wholly owned separate entity, Ferrari. By 1997, 100% of the assets were shifted to Ferrari. Maserati's former rival became its benevolent owner. The mutual history and commonalities created a bond that helped Maserati begin to develop a fresh lineup of cars. Some thought it was strange for Fiat or Ferrari to buy a competitor and nurse it back to health. It's a really smart uh, move on uh, Fiat and Ferrari's part because Ferrari is very protective of their marketplace. And though they like, might like to build more cars and different models, they won't do that because they will lower the values of the Ferraris that they sell today. And so their ability to expand is now based on uh, their ownership of the Maserati marquee. The first new Maserati to be distributed worldwide was the Spider. Launched at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 2001, its arrival was watched with great anticipation. Cars are great, they're reliable, they're comfortable, they're incredibly fast, and uh, just wonderful cars to drive. To appeal once again to people who needed more than two seats, Maserati created the Quattroporti in 2003. The Quattroporti is uh, absolutely redefined the sedan. At the same time, you've got a car that has got styling and an interior and exterior that is just unsurpassed. Other new cars in the pipeline, like the Grand Sport, made people believe that Maserati had been reinvented. It had reconnected with its heritage of performance and style. For over 90 years, Maserati has been creating exceptional cars for the road and the track. It's a company that's weathered the ups and downs of financial uncertainty, wars, and changing tastes. Once again, it has taken its place among the builders of the finest motor cars in the world.